Hi, I'm Steve Selleck, uh, founder of FitTest, and in part seven of my series on atrial fibrillation and exercise, I'm going to present a, another case study with a very important take home message. And also I've been asked to provide a summary of all of the interventions that I've talked about in this series into one slide, which is coming up on the very next slide. So the medical interventions for atrial fibrillation consist of the heart rhythm controlling medications. And the goal of these treatments is to return the patient back to sinus rhythm, in other words, a regular rhythm from their atrial fibrillation arrhythmia. And the main drugs that are used to try and uh, achieve this outcome are the calcium channel blockers, amiodarone and sotalol. And occasionally you'll see flecainide. I don't see flecainide much in my practice as an exercise physiologist because it's more used in the acute setting and I only see post-acute clients. And also so many of the conditions that I see, uh, flecainide is contraindicated. So I don't see that much, but I'm just mentioning it here. The heart rate controlling medications are beta blockers, and it's easy to remember because they end in LOL, of which the main ones that are used to control heart rate, and by controlling, usually that means reducing heart rate in people with atrial fibrillation who have heart rates at rest and almost certainly during exercise that are considered to be too high. So there are a lot of um, therapeutic reasons for reducing heart rate in people with atrial fibrillation. The main three beta blockers that you'll see are atenolol, metoprolol, and we also see sotalol, which we saw here as a calcium channel blocker or a membrane stabiliser. It's also a beta blocker. Now how this works in the setting of atrial fibrillation, I think it's worth just mentioning this. So in atrial fibrillation, the sinus node, the sinoatrial node is in fact uh, not in action um, because the chaotic electrical activity is occurring, uh, actually consumes the electrical activity of the upper chambers, of the atria, and effectively blocks out any action from the sinus node. So these uh, chaotic arrhythmic wavelets of, of electrical energy are uh, occurring all over the atria and effectively knock out the main pacemaker tissue, the sinus node. And as I said in part one of this series, these chaotic wavelets of electrical activity can then get through the atrioventricular node into to stimulate the ventricles, the lower chambers, the pumping chambers, but at a chaotic uh, rhythm, hence the arrhythmia in atrial fibrillation. Now, in the setting where the um, arrhythmia persists, in other words, heart, ryth heart rhythm controlling medications or other interventions were not successful or haven't been tried in someone with atrial fibrillation, then the next important therapeutic goal is to try and control heart rate. Um, and the medications, as I said, the main ones are the beta blockers, the tenolol, metoprolol, sotalol, and some other beta blockers. Uh, the calcium channel blockers come up again for controlling heart rate, their membrane stabilizers. And digoxin also works directly on the AV node as an AV node blocker, atrioventricular node to block here. Now the beta blockers and the AV nodal, nodal blocker digoxin work by uh, slowing the conduction or letting less electrical activity, less events of electrical activity known as action potentials through this filter and so the AV node effectively acts as a filter to prevent a very high heart rate coming from this chaos in the upper chambers. We still have the arrhythmia in the lower chambers but at a more controlled rate and that's the key of the beta blockers, the first line drugs for atrial fibrillation for people who are permanently in the arrhythmia. So then moving on to the anti-clotting medications which I won't talk about at great length here. The main ones and, and the reason for giving anti-clotting medications, as I said in part one, is that clots can form in the atria due to very low amount of pumping activity. And those clots can break off and go to the brain where they can cause a, a stroke, for example. So the main anti-clotting agents that are used are the oral anticoagulants or OACs. The uh, most commonly prescribed are the ZAR bands, the 10A bands. It's easy to remember because they 
block factor 10A, 10A in Roman numerals, which is one of the key enzymes in the enzymatic uh, thrombogenic pathway to produce thrombin and blood clots. So the Zar bands, it's easy to remember, uh, they block that enzyme. And the most common of those is rivaroxaban or Xarelto, then Apixaban or Eliquis. I don't see Edoxaban much in my practice. Dubigatran is an alternative to these, and this is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Then you've got the vitamin K antagonists, of which um, warfarin is the uh, most commonly prescribed, or Coumadin. But this is really only used these days, mainly used these days for valvular uh, atrial fibrillation. And so these are in, this should be in the minority of the anti-clotting um, agents that are given to atrial fibrillation clients. Uh, then we move on to cardioversion, which is um, elective defibrillation uh, while the person is under light anaesthetic to try and restore the rhythm. I've got a question mark there because it doesn't always work. And if it does work, it often uh, does revert back to atrial fibrillation at some point in the next, usually in the next few months. Uh, then we have ablation, which again, question mark rhythm if uh, this is successful. And in another presentation, I went over these two methods, which you can look at in another uh, presentation in this series. Um, and the, the two main ablation methods are pulmonary vein isolation or atrioventricular nodal ablation. When the AV node is ablated, then this electrically separates out the chaos in the upper chambers uh, from the what's going on in the lower chambers. Then the lower chambers can be paced into a rhythm and, a, and an appropriate rate. So that's uh, a very successful treatment that's often used. Now I come on to my case study of which there's a very good learning moment coming up. And this is a 65 year old male that then in, on the 10th of June, 2011 was diagnosed with new atrial fibrillation, uh, presented to me as an exercise physiologist just about two weeks later. And that's the key point here in this case. Medications, he was on just a starter dose of Sotalol. And I certainly missed that, that he was on a low dose Sotalol and that was not enough to control his heart rate, as you will see in a minute. He was also not on a first-line oral anticoagulant, uh, such as um, Rivaroxaban, Xarelto, or even Dubigatran. So that wasn't there. He wasn't on warfarin either. So there was no real strong anticoagulant therapy going on there. So pre-exercise, he's clearly the ventricles are clearly out of rhythm. And you can see the arrhythmia running along the baseline, which is the atrial fibrillation. Um, so that um, uh, is uh, very typical of atrial fibrillation. The heart rate was quite high. In another uh, uh, video in my series on atrial fibrillation, I talked about lenient rate control versus, um, versus strict rate control. Um, this you would look at and say lenient rate control. But really the key is it's come back to this low dose of sotalol, which will become important to, to the, this case study in a minute. So again, after seeing this high heart rate, we um, try to get him to relax for a while. And a low heart rate came down. He was still in atrial fibrillation, obviously, with the ventricle, ventricular arrhythmia, uh, very obvious from these uh, large spikes. When we went to exercise, we had um, quite a lot of arrhythmia, but you'll notice that it suddenly accelerated um, at this point where we stopped exercise. And this instantaneous heart rate here was in fact 250 beats, 254 beats per minute actually. So in here, the heart rate was 254 and remained way over 200 all the way through here. And this was a 65 year old male. Now I did have the advantage of having um, a, an ECG for this, but you could also pick this up with a dramatic rise in heart rate, as I'll show you uh, later on in this slide. Uh, recovery at 10 seconds, um, he was actually, th this very high heart rate of 250 plus persisted all the way through this record. So all the way through here, heart rate above 250. Think about that for a minute. This is a 65 year old male with a heart rate above 250, he was conscious. We were getting him off the ergometer, but he was conscious and talking to us and we were trying to not excite him further. Recovery at 25 seconds, there was a change in rhythm here. 
And in a minute, you'll see that there was uh, somewhat of a rhythm restored. In fact, uh, we can start to see it here. So now we've got from, from an arrhythmia all the way through here, back to a rhythm here, but a very fast heart rate. He is sitting on a chair here with a heart rate of about 180 plus. So this is already well above his age predicted heart rate max all the way through here, recovery way above. So there's something very excitable going on. But the interesting thing is that the, um, the rhythm was now, um, was now uh, rhythmical uh, and you can actually see the P waves in most of these complexes there, which means the sinoatrial node has taken up the rhythm again, which wasn't either a good outcome or a bad outcome. It's just, I'm just noting it here with the heart rate very high, still at 180 plus. At 10 minutes 30, um, he jumped out of that rhythm of 180 and um, um, looked almost flatlined for a while, which is not a very pleasant thing to be um, seeing because I'm responsible for his safety. Uh, so um, almost a cardiac standstill for a bit of this, but then he jumped back into something of a rhythm at um, half a minute after this. And here we can see P waves again. So he's back in sinus rhythm here. Uh, with, but these um, pauses here are quite disconcerting if you're in charge of, uh, of this situation. Um, so at 17 minutes, in fact, he went, left the facility uh, with a rhythmical heart, which was interesting. Um, uh, and um, um, you can see the P waves there and the heart rate was in fact back to way below the pre-exercise levels. So in a stupid way, I could say that the, the exercise that we gave to my client actually triggered him to uh, revert from the arrhythmia to sinus rhythm, but I'm certainly not going to be arrogant enough to claim that benefit of exercise if that didn't exist. This was purely a coincidence. Now, the, now I just want to show you the heart rates here. So the, the, if you didn't have an ECG, then you would be able to get a heart rate record that would also be extremely useful. So this is a heart rate record over the whole of the exercise test here and all of the recovery here. So there's about oh, eight, eight to 10 minutes of exercise and about 17 minutes of recovery. Clearly through the early parts of exercise, the heart rate was, was tr tracking along quite well, admittedly out of rhythm. That's the fact that it's not going up in a straight line, but lots of jagged um, parts of the curve here, which is really reflected in the arrhythmia. Uh, but then this heart rate going above 250, which caused us to stop exercise, coming down at um, about one minute in the first minute, coming down to this constant rate of 180 plus beats for about 10 minutes until recovery 10 minutes 30. Then he jumped right back down to below 40 heart rate and then came up and settled at a heart rate of about 70 by the time he left the facility. So you could get all of this, of course, with a decent heart rate monitor most of the modern um, smart watches and so on with the, with the apps will give you a record a little bit like this and it would still be extremely useful. Of course, we're not diagnosing without an ECG, but this would still be an extremely useful record to pass on to the primary care medical practitioner um, to show that heart rate was not under control. So we don't have rhythm under control, although I, I said here he left with rhythm. But at rest, pre-exercise, he was not, he did not have rhythm control. And during exercise, he certainly did not have rate control. So we don't have either rhythm or rate control. Now, coming back to the start of dose and the take-home message for me was that this client was really in new atrial fibrillation and he was not medically stable. And he was also only on a starter dose of uh, rhythm control and rate control. Remember, Sotolol does both. It's both a beta blocker and a calcium channel uh, and a potassium channel blocker, which means it is um, a membrane stabiliser for rhythm uh, and also for rate. Now, the soda log was not doing the job adequately, clearly, in this case. So then going on with this case, um, a few months later in that year, uh, he had hired a personal trainer. So I, I've obviously remarked on this. And presumably, I wasn't seeing him as a client, but presumably he was going up in the dose of Sotolol. But he had had recent episodes of feeling funny after exercise, and he was aware of palpitations during those personal training sessions. 
A month after that, he collapsed at home and was admitted to coronary care unit and had a, a permanent pacemaker fitted. And I just want to show you uh, what happened to the pacemaker because I actually got to test him over the next few years after this. He wasn't an ongoing client of mine, but I was able to test him uh, once a year for his rate and rhythm. So you've already seen the pre-pacemaker when he had atrial fibrillation. That was my first exercise assessment of my client. Um, in 2014, a couple of years after, three years after his pacemaker was fitted, uh, you can see here that the pacemaker is over-triggering here a little bit in early exercise. And we had some triggering occurring in, uh, at, uh, in recovery. And you'll notice here this flat line here, this is completely desirable and expected for someone with a pacemaker. The pacemaker is working perfectly here, which means he is being paced at exactly, uh, I think it was 70 beats, it might have been 80 beats, but anyway, let's say it was 70. Absolutely constant pacing at 70, which is the main indication for the pacemaker to stop the heart rate going too low. The heart rate with, uh, under pacing can also help to prevent it from going too high, but that's really the beta blocker more than the uh, pacemaker. There was another triggering event here in recovery. When I tested him a year after that, we had almost no triggering during exercise or over-triggering during exercise. And we only had one over-triggering event in recovery. And then uh, finally in 2016, which was the last time I tested him, we had a nice characteristic pacemaker increase in heart rate here, but not over-triggering. Very, um, very typical heart rate response to exercise with a pacemaker. And then we just had one very small over-triggering event in recovery and he flatlined all the way through here, which means he was being paced all the way through there. So thank you for um, listening and watching this short video on a, an important case study with an important take-home message. And also um, I've fulfilled my goal of trying to revise the interventions all on one slide for those who are interested in, in that. So you can contact me at info at myfittest.com.au and have a great day. Bye for now. Bye.